Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the launch of the UKRI National Interdisciplinary Circular Economy Research Program. Uh, my name is Jin Xuan. So I'm a professor and head of Department of Chemical Engineering at Loughborough University. I'm also the director of the Center for Circular Chemical Economy. Uh, this week is a national launch week for the uh, UKRI NICER program. So that's the Interdisciplinary Circular Economy Research Program. Uh, within this week, we have a series of uh, launch events uh, for different research centers and also the hub. Uh, so today uh, we are focusing on the uh, Circular Chemical Economy Center, but you are also very welcome to join other center events uh, such as uh, the metal one that the metal for tech one in the afternoon and the circular metal on Wednesday. And on Thursday, there will be the uh, launch for the circular economy hub. Okay, so uh, before we go to the program, uh, let's uh, have some housekeeping uh, introductions. So if you are encountering any technical uh, issues, uh, please use the chat to raise your, uh, your, your, your question. So we have very nice, uh, uh, technical support, Paul and Becky here will be working in the background to support you. And uh, please do send a message if you're having any technical difficulties. Uh, the event is being recorded and a film will be made uh, from the video footage. So if you, you do not want to be recorded, please just keep your camera off. And if you would like to tweet about the event, the event hashtag uh, across social media is a uh, nicer program uh, UK. So uh, Smita, if you can just uh, type the, uh, the hashtag in the chat box so everyone can follow that. There has also been a, a participant survey uh, sent through to you, I think, uh, yesterday. So it will be really, really helpful if you can spare some time to complete the survey. Okay, so uh, now I would like to spend around 10 minutes to have a very brief introduction of our center. Uh, so the name of our center is the UKRI Interdisciplinary Center for Circular Chemical Economy. And uh, within the center, we have a very nice team. So the center is uh, in partnership with seven institutions, uh, Loughborough, Cardiff, uh, Liverpool, Harrywood, Sheffield, Newcastle, and the Imperial College. So we are really an interdisciplinary team consisting of uh, scientists, chemists, uh, engineers, computer scientists, and the social scientists trying to tackle the very complex grand challenge around the circular economy and the sustainability, particularly for the chemical industry. And the, on the right-hand side are our industrial partners. As you can see, these are also range from uh, those multinationals are key players in the chemical industry and also uh, local SMEs, uh, NGOs, and the government departments. So I would now like to invite all the uh, center members to turn on your videos and uh, just say hello to the audience. So hopefully you will find uh, some uh, familiar faces. Okay. Hello, everyone. So uh, these are ranging from our uh, co-investigators, uh, center managers, administrative support, PhD students, and the research associates. So as I said, hopefully you will rec recognize some uh, familiar faces here. All right, so Paul, please go back to the uh, slides. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so just some background. So this center is a part of a 30 million government investment uh, funded by the UKRI Strategic Priority Fund with government departments such as DEFRA and the BASE to trying to move the UK towards a circular economy in the textile, construction, chemical, and the metal industry. So this is a aim of the overall program. And of course, we are more focused on the chemical industry. Next slide. Uh, our vision is to transform the UK chemical industry's linear supply chain model into a fossil independent, chemical, climate positive, and environmentally friendly uh, circular economy. How are we going to do that? So uh, this will be achieved by creating the novel circular resources flow of olefin, 
and their complementary feedstocks. So why we are focusing on all of them? Because it is of overwhelming importance to the chemical industry, which, account, which is accounting for 70% more of all organic chemical products. So uh, as shown in the right-hand side, we have de designed several routes trying to convert different types of waste, biomass, and CO2 emissions back into uh, olefins and their complementary feedstock, trying to create a circular resources mode uh, around the chemical industry. So in the next few slides, I just want to introduce what we're gonna do or what, what uh, research themes are covered uh, uh, within the center. So the first research theme is led by Professor Alex Cohen uh, at Liverpool University. So we are looking at uh, different new enabling technologies because there's no one size fits for all approach. So we need to look at various new technologies to recover chemical feedstocks uh, from end of life materials. So here just listed some of our initial focus. Uh, focuses. So we'll look at, for example, combination of biological and the thermal chemical processes, trying to convert waste biomass into alkanes and olefins. And we also look at the electrochemical methods trying to convert CO2 emissions to olefin, either directly or in indirectly. And we're also looking at some uh, technologies, which is at uh, very low TRL levels such as hydrogenolysis, so which we can convert waste polymers into mid-range alkanes. Uh, the second theme we are looking at uh, is a whole system approach, uh, which is led by Professor Banwa Chachalet at Imperial College, because we need to advance the knowledge on the evolving chemical value chain over the entire life cycle, instead of just looking at individual points. So the thing we are looking at in this themes are, for example, process integrations. So when we have the new technologies, we do want to look at how these technologies can be integrated into the wider infrastructure or how the entire chemical sector can be integrated as a part of the wider clusters. And we will also look at life cycle assessment of the any new processes or systems to make sure that the sustainability around the whole life cycle. And very uniquely, we also look at the social justice side of the transition towards a circular economy. So this part is led by Professor Peter Starin at Sheffield University. Uh, last but not least, uh, we also look at a theme of policy, society, and the finance that is led by Dr. Binshu from Harriwatt Universities. So we realize there are also complex non-technical barriers around, for example, business motivations, finance gap, public awareness, and the policy incentive that need to be solved to deliver the circular economy. Uh, so within this scene, we will look at, for example, business models and the finance solutions. Uh, we are also trying to develop campaigns to engage with the publics to enhance the public acceptance of the circular economy. And we're also uh, very much are working closely with uh, policymakers uh, to trying to use evidence to uh, to support the policy uh, development. So these are pretty much uh, the three research themes that we are we will be looking at in the next four years. Uh, next, I would like to highlight some opportunities that uh, you can collaborate with us. And we do really need to collaborate with a wide range of stakeholders and the research community because a circular economy will not be possible unless the network of organizations are willing to work together as an ecosystem, including the stakeholders along the supply chain, uh, but also the government, third parties, and the public. So there are different ways to, to, to work with us. So the first thing, and the easiest thing you can do is to join our user and the stakeholder forum from where you will receive our newsletters. You will be keep updated on opportunities such as workshops, training courses that will uh, happen in the next months, next few months. And you can also get access to our expertise. For example, we have joint PhD studentship available and for industrial partners, if you're interested in particular uh, technologies, there's always opportunities for consultancy work and a joint R&D projects. Uh, particularly for SMEs, there's a dedicated Innovate UK call, uh, funding call that will be released very soon. So there are 2.5 million pounds uh, 
funding in total available uh, across this year and the next year. So we will have an SME workshop uh, plan in September to, to facilitate SME partners to, uh, to, to apply for this Innovate UK funding. And if you are an academic member of the UK research community, there's also an opportunity from the CE hub, so that's a circular economy hub, national circular economy hub. So there will be a feasibility funding call released uh, very soon. So it's uh, we will fund several projects with each project around 50K uh, pounds. So it's, it's not a big project, but it's really to facilitate the collaboration uh, and the participation from the wider uh, research community to participate in this NICER program. So uh, the funding call, uh, the scope of the funding call will be to study the resources flows have already identified by the five uh, research centers. But you don't need to be collaborating with us before, but it will be always good if you talk with us because one of the objectives is to, to enhance collaborations. So if you want to find more information about all these uh, funding calls and the opportunities to work with us, uh, please send us an email. So we I have just listed our uh, email address circular.chemical at loveboard.ac.uk. And I think in the chat box, there will be also some information and links to particular uh, funding calls. So, that's a very brief introduction. So hopefully uh, you will find it useful and you have a brief idea about what, what, who we are and what we're gonna do in the next uh, uh, four years. Okay, so that's the brief introduction. And the next, we will have the keynote address uh, from uh, Professor Sir Richard Catalo. So uh, I would like to welcome Professor Catalo. Uh, before I hand over to, to, to Richard, I just want to make a very short and a brief introduction. Uh, I don't think it should it need to be long because Richard is so well known. Uh, so Professor Richard Catalo is a professor in material chemistry and catalysis at Cardiff and the UCL. Uh, he's currently the foreign secretary and the vice president of the Royal Society. He has been awarded a knighthood in the Queen's uh, birthday honors 2020. Uh, Professor Catalo has worked for over 30 years in the field of computational and experimental studies of complex inorganic materials, pioneering a wide range of applications of computational technologies uh, in solid state uh, chemistry. His group has been instrumental in techniques and code development, including research work on embed embedded cluster methodology for application to the study of catalytic reactions. Uh, back to last year, uh, Professor Catalo has organized a series of Royal Society event discussion science to enable the circular economy with topics ranging from fuels and chemicals, polymers, biotechnologies, and also techno-economic, societal, and environmental impact of the circular economy. All of them are very relevant to the remit of our Center for Circular Chemical Economy. So we are very proud to have Professor Catalo as a co-investigator of our center. So today he will give the keynote in our launch event discussing the role of science in enabling a circular economy. So without further ado, may I hand over to, to Richard. Richard, thank you very much. You're muted. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, very generous, kind introduction. And it's a real pleasure to be able to join this meeting today and to congratulate you and the leadership team on the launch of this very important uh, uh, consortium project. Now I'll try and share my screen. Is that working? I trust that is working. So, um, I'm, trying, I'm addressing today an enormous topic, and that is the science that we need to enable a circular economy. Of course, uh, this is the theme of much of the work of the CE Center. I will only be able to talk about one or two issues, but I think perhaps the most important point that, that I will make is on this slide here. 
And that is that to achieve the circular economy, we need innovation in science and technology, of course, together with societal and behavioral change. We have some of the science and technology at present, which will allow us to make progress. But if we are to achieve the circular economy, we do need new science and technology. And I think it's important to emphasize that point right from the beginning. Um, now, as, as was said, we organized, I think, a very useful and enjoyable and interesting uh, Royal Society discussion meeting a couple of years ago on science to enable the circular economy. Um, it produced a proceedings of philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, and uh, that, those proceedings do treat in depth a number of the key issues. I'll really only be able to scratch the surface during this talk, so I do commend this issue uh, to you. There's some really significant publications there. So the themes I'll try to address first are some of the challenges, and in fact, the enormity of the challenges, um, but the type of scientific response that we're going to need. Towards the end of the talk, I'd like to emphasize the importance of life cycle analysis. That was um, mentioned in the introduction. It's a key component of work to achieve the circular economy. And then perhaps right at the end, a few speculations on uh, new horizons for the field. Let's now start thinking about the challenges and the science. And I'll start with some rather general points that relate to linearity versus circularity, sustainability and green chemistry. We're probably aware of all these issues, uh, but I think they're worth emphasizing. Then we'll look at two major challenges, again, that we're all aware of, and that is the development of a circular polymers and plastics economy, an absolutely key challenge, and the challenges around CO2. I hope also to refer as the talk progresses to issues relating to biomass utilization and to the development of greener ammonia, which I think is, is a key challenge. Now let's just think first about linearity versus circularity. I should, by the way, at this stage, thank Matthew Davidson from the University of Bath, who has helped me with this part of the talk. What we have on the left-hand side, essentially is largely what we're doing now. That is, we take natural resources, really a mixture of technical and biological materials, we take them, we make products, and at the end of the life, we largely dispose of those products. Now, we are making progress on recycling, but this is not a bad description of the majority of what we're doing at present. Now, as you know, what we need to do is to transform that whole process as we develop the circular economy. Uh, we need to, in our, with our biological materials, yes, to make and consume products, but then the waste we need to do to enrich to get this circularity. With our technical materials, again, we need to make and use products, but then we need to return them. Now, that is easier said than done. That is essentially the challenge. Here in a little bit more detail is what we need to do. A circular economy is an industrial system that is restorative by design. And I think that sentence needs emphasis. Restorative by design right from the beginning of the whole system. With technical cycles, uh, we start with increasing them being increasingly powered by renewable energy, but then we recycle, we refurbish, we reuse, and we maintain. With the biological materials, again, we consume, but then after consumption, we need to extract biochemical feedstocks using a variety of procedures, and we return and enrich. So uh, just let me repeat, the whole system needs to be restorative by design. This slide just emphasizes the point that we need loops, we need reusing loops, we need recycling loops, and we need renewing loops. So I think we all know that, but we do need to emphasize this and we need to emphasize the challenges. Now, a few words about sustainability. Um, uh, the, I think the 1987 definition of sustainability is hard to improve on, the ability to provide for the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In my view, that is a, a very good and very eloquent way of summarizing uh, the needs for sustainability. And again, economic development, social development, and environmental protection are all in integrated and mutually reinforcing pillars. 
Natural resources, we need to use at rates that don't deplete supplies over the long term. And residues should be generated at rates no higher than can the environment can assimilate. We all know these, but they're worth emphasizing. Now, let's just think for a moment about the sustainable development goals. These are, in my view, a really important and key aspect of <clears throat> the way in which we're going to, where we, ways in which we have to develop our planet. There, as it says here, a shared vision of humanity and a social contract between the world's leaders and the people. Now, I'm not going to go through all the SDGs, but I am going to emphasize that many of them will, will require scientific and technological innovation if they're going to be achieved. And I think the scientific community needs to give even higher emphasis and profile to the SDGs. We're picking out here three that are particularly relevant to the theme of the circular economy, to build a resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization, and of course, foster innovation, to ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns, to conserve and sustainably use the oceans and marine resources. These are all very, very key components of the achieving the circular economy. And I rather like this concept here, <clears throat> a safe and just space for humanity. The idea is that we have a social foundation that has key social needs such as education, employment, um, and key physical needs, food, water, energy. And those provide this foundation, but then we have a space within, within which humanity can live safely and sustainably, but there is an environmental ceiling to that space. So we need to stay within this safe and just space. And of course, the circular economy is striving to do that. Now, a few words about green chemistry. Again, we're all familiar with green chemistry and absolutely integrally involved in the circular economy. It's about displacing stoichiometric technologies with greener catalytic alternatives. It's about the change from fossil-based to renewable bio-based manufacture. It's about the transition from an unsustainable economy, of course, to a circular one. And this again emphasizes designs, products and processes with conservation of resources in mind. So these are all important concepts. I'm taking this from a very important article uh, from Roger Sheldon published in Green Chemistry. Now, let me, having discussed these rather generalities, move on now to some of the challenges. And it's impossible to talk about the circular economy without discussing the enormity of the plastics challenge. And again, I'd like to thank Mark Davidson uh, for helping me to put this part of the talk uh, together. Some of the figures are pretty staggering. One million plastic bottles bought globally every minute. Each person on the planet will generate twice their body weight in plastic weight every year if we have a business as usual scenario by 2050. So we'll, these begin to allow one to feel the scale of the challenge. Here are some data, a little bit out of date actually. On the left hand side, we've got data for 2014, 311 uh, <coughs> megatons of uh, plastic production. Um, we look at what's going on in the oceans, there's about a one to five ratio of uh, plastics to fish. Plastics are about 6% of global oil consumption and 1% share of the carbon budget. It, the business as usual scenario would mean that the plastic production would almost quadruple by 2050, which isn't that far away, that the uh, ratio of plastics to fish in the ocean by weight will be one to one. Plastics will be 20% of the oil consumption and 15% of the carbon budget. Of course, this, this is unsustainable completely. Just let's look at the plastic waste generation. Again, this is a business as the usual scenario, and we see the amount of waste increasing dramatically, um, even with various um, <coughs> approaches such as incineration and recycling. So there really is an absolutely enormous problem here. Growth of plastic waste, one gigaton per year by 2050. Uh, just here giving, allows one to see some of the, the growth 
of the business as usual scenario broken down into region and we see very, very substantial growth projected for the Middle East and Africa as their economies develop. On the top left hand side of this slide, we have a kind of interesting commentary on the uh, current chemical sector, which if, if you look at that, you see is largely taking fossil based feedstocks, converting them into thermoplastics, other products and fertilizers. Of course, then we will have to change the feedstocks, and that is the scale of the challenge. I just want to emphasize the, the challenge a little bit more. This is largely what we're doing at present. I say that the data are a little bit old, but this can relate to packaging plastics. And we see that actually only 14% of this was a few years ago, are collected for recycling and quite a lot of pro loss in the process of recycling. We see a lot high proportion going to landfill, quite a lot going to incineration and a large amount, an alarmingly large amount of leakage. And again, just to bring the point home here, we're looking at the kind of total uh, plastics consumption, primary production uh, we see on the left, in use stocks in the middle, discarded on the right, and the proportion of recycled we see is relatively low. So we do have an enormous challenge, and this is what we need to move to. We need to move to a system that recycles and reuses. And there will be major technical challenges in recycling, in re reusing, and in designing and, uh, and production, and technical challenges in minimizing leakage and developing where appropriate energy recovery. Uh, in responding to these technical challenges, catalysis and processes for enhanced effectiveness will be absolutely vital. They need to be robust and benign. We will need for things like self-healing materials, and we need program degradation and chemical recycling, and we need design for reuse. Right, now here's just perhaps a, a brief glimpse of the kind of thing we need to do. Chemicals and polymers require a hydrocarbon toolkit. That hydrocarbon toolkit at present is largely provided by petrochemicals. They provide an oxygenate toolkit, which we can provide from renewable platforms. But what we need to do is replace the, <coughs> replace the petrochemical platform by a renewable hydrocarbon platform. But this is something which is feasible, but it's something that this center and others need to focus on. Let me say a few words about the CO2 challenge. Again, we're all aware of the huge challenge of CO2. And the first component of the CO2 challenge, of course, is climate. But then there are other important issues that sometimes don't receive, in my view, the attention that they should. And that is the fact that we're going to need to use CO2 as a carbon source, because we can't go on indefinitely using petrochemicals as a carbon source. And we need to develop sustainable hydrocarbon fuels. Now, we're all aware of the CO2 challenge with uh, regarding climate. Uh, this slide illustrates actually what we need to do. On the left hand side, you see the global with total net CO2 um, emissions at present. We need to get those down to net zero over not a very long period, 30 years, if we're going to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. It's a huge challenge. I believe it is a challenge to which humanity can respond but it is a huge challenge and it is worth emphasizing that. But as I said, there are other aspects of the CO2 challenge. CO2 as a carbon source in the post-fossil fuel era, we will need to do that. We will need to use CO2 as, as <coughs> CO2 as a base for developing chemicals and fuels and CO2 hydrogenation, a key chemical process will be needed to produce fuels and chemicals. So I'd like now just to give a few glimpses of some enabling science, some of which I've been involved in, uh, and emphasize the key role of catalysis. And the first is work at Cardiff on utilizing glycerol. The second is work on the Harwell Center on carbon dioxide hydrogenation. And the third is work that I've been involved in together with Justin Hargreaves at the University of Glasgow on investigating catalysis for greener ammonia. 
First, let me highlight this very nice work, I think, on glycerol led by McDummer and Graham Hutchings at Cardiff. Now, glycerol, I think, as you probably know, is a waste product from biodiesel production. Um, it actually has great potential as a feedstock for useful chemicals, uh, but the glycerol you obtain when you <coughs> uh, produce your fatty acid methyl esters from triglycerides uh, is usually diluted and it contains impurities. What this work aimed to do was to develop catalytic processes that would convert the glycerol into methanol, which you could then feed back into the whole process, making it circular and sustainable. And what they found was that, in fact, a range of metal oxide catalysts could affect this very interesting catalytic chemistry. Cerium dioxide, which is a very versatile oxide catalyst, can affect the conversion of glycerol into methanol. Um, the selectivity is, is not fantastic, but it, this is nevertheless a useful process. So not only can CO2 do this, but it actually can work with the dilute and impure feedstock. It's better if you have a pure solution. That's what the data here is showing. It's better if you have a pure solution, but the catalysis does work with the real feedstock. So I think this is a really significant development because what it says is you can take this glycerol, which isn't otherwise much use, you can use it to generate methanol, which you then feed back into the process. So it's a nice piece of circular chemistry. And I should emphasize, I wasn't involved in this. Nick Dummer, Graham Hutchings and colleagues at Cardiff led this work. The second is some work, but actually fundamental work, but we will need fundamental work on CO2 hydrogenation. We will need to understand the mechanisms of these reactions if we're going to optimize them. So here I'm highlighting work of uh, Michael Hyam, who works in the Harwell team, uh, the Harwell Catalysis Center. And Michael has done a very in-depth survey of the mechanisms of CO2 hydrogenation on copper, but on other catalysts. It's a complex mechanistic route, and I don't have the time to take you through it, but it's been explored in detail. What you what the process starts with CO2, either dissociation or direct hydrogenation. We think on copper, it's direct hydrogenation. It goes through a range of intermediates, formic acid, formaldehyde, and methanol is the final product. But we, in fact, know that the more effective catalyst, in fact, is copper deposited on zinc oxide. And as part of this work, we have shown that you can activate copper more effectively on nanoparticles of copper deposited on zinc oxide. So that's giving us real insight into the catalytic process. And this is, of course, all computer modeling work. And in my view, we will need the guidance from computer modeling if we are going to optimize the catalysts that we need for these essential chemical processes. Let me take my final example, one I really like, and that's the mechanism of ammonia synthesis. It's again computational work on transition metal nitrides, um, the move towards greener ammonia. And here I'm highlighting work of Constantino Sin, Alipur Yazdi, work that we've done in collaboration with Justin Hargreaves. Now, we all know the background to this. Um, we need ammonia is absolutely vital. Um, and ammonia is made by reacting nitrogen with hydrogen, usually hydrogen obtained, in fact, from fossil fuels. Um, and we use the famous Harbour-Bosch uh, catalytic process. Um, we need, do need to do mod moderate temperatures in order for this catalysis to proceed, and we need high pressure. The whole process is energy intensive, and we need to try and find a catalyst that works at lower temperatures and pressures. And very nice work of Justin Hargreaves, experimental work, in fact, has shown that a, a cobalt molybdenum nitride catalyst can, in fact, do this. It can, it can synthesize ammonia at lower temperatures and pressures. But that's just a few words about the Harbour Bosch process. I mean, the Harbour Bosch process is an absolute milestone in the development of chemist, cat, catalysis and chemistry. And if you ever want an illustration of the importance of both catalysis and chemistry, you can point out that the nutritional requirements of something like 40% 
of the global population are dependent on nitrogen that is fixed by the Harbour Bosch process. But the Harbour Bosch process is in fact brute force chemistry. The mechanism is rather simple. You absorb nitrogen and hydrogen on the metal surface and you have to break the nitrogen 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 bond. So you have to break the strongest bond in chemistry. So as I said, this is brute force chemistry. Can we replace it by something a bit cleverer? Well, what this computational work suggested was that we could. If we take these cobalt molybdenum nitrides, they rather easily make vacancies on their surface. And what the computational work showed was that those vacancies can trap nitrogen molecules. Once they've trapped nitrogen molecules, those molecules are now activated and they can start to pick up hydrogen atoms that are absorbed on the surface. They pick up hydrogen atoms without dissociation, without breaking that nitrogen nitrogen bond. And so we can hydrogenate uh, <coughs> the, the nitrogen molecule and then it dissociates when that NN bond is only a single bond, which is much easier to break. So this is an associative, non-dissociative mechanism. And we believe that developing non-dissociative mechanisms is the key to developing greener routes to synthesizing ammonia. This slide just shows that you can follow the details of the mechanism. It's an energy profile. You can identify all the intermediates. And but the take home message is that low temperature ammonia is possible on this catalyst. It has a large number of nitrogen vacancies and it can occur under milder conditions because it's an associative mechanism. Well, let me now move to my next theme, which I'll only treat very briefly because I think we're all aware of this. And this is the environmental aspects of the circular economy and the need for life cycle analysis. And uh, uh, I'd like to highlight the work here of Adiza Azapajic from the University of Manchester, um, who has done very, very interesting and important work in this field, and she kindly let me have these slides. And she emphasises that what we need is a systems approach and life cycle thinking. Yes, we have resources, we need to think about the economic costs, the social impacts and the social benefits, the economic benefits, but then the environmental impacts. And then again, I think I've showed you this slide again. We need to build in restorative processes, regenerative and restorative processes. Now, I'm just going to give you one example from many which uh, uh, Adisa has investigated, and that is just concerns food waste to digest, compost, burn or bury. And in fact, uh, a very large amount of household food waste is generated in the UK, quite a significant proportion of which is managed. And these are the ways in which you can manage it, anaerobic digestion, in-vessel composting, incineration, landfill. So you need to do an LCA, a life cycle analysis, to decide what is perhaps the most appropriate approach. And what I'll not go through the analysis, but just go straight to the results. In-vessel composting is the worst option for most impacts, which you know surprises one, it certainly surprised me, but when you do the LCA, that is what you find. Anaerobic digestion is the best option for carbon footprint, it's much higher acidification, and in fact, greater benefits achieved through waste prevention. So I think just for this one example, it illustrates the importance of building in LCA uh, to the whole analysis. Now, finally, I say some new horizons. Uh, here I'm highlighting some work by a colleague at the Royal Society, Jack Pilkington, working in the uh, policy team at the Royal Society, who has been uh, studying uh, issues relating to animate materials. It's really fascinating. Materials are typically inanimate, but animate materials uh, <coughs> made by humans aim to mimic the properties of nature. That is, they have self-healing properties, they harvest energy, and they repurpose at the end of life. And again, a lot of work here, I haven't time to go into in detail, but what this is saying is build, as people develop these kind of materials, a really fascinating challenge, build in sustainability and circularity at the outset. Um, Animal materials could help build the future, but they won't by default. We need to build in environmental impacts at the research and design stage. That again is just emphasizing the importance of LCA.
Well, here are now some final reflections that I'd like to leave with you. Uh, they are that we need to respond to the scientific challenges, but in our response, we want first to exploit the latest techniques and infrastructure. Next, I think we need to use all the digital capabilities. And thirdly, we need to collaborate and coordinate. Now, I know the center is going to do all these things, but let's just talk about the latest techniques and infrastructure. Here, we're looking at an aerial view of the Harwell campus where we have our catalysis center. And you'll see that lovely circular feature there, which is the diamond light source. Uh, more in the foreground, you see the ISIS neutron source. Uh, of course, there is a central laser facility as well on this uh, fantastic uh, uh, science and innovation campus. We have a catalysis center there. And what we have learned over the last six or seven years is that these world-class facilities, synchrotron, neutron, and laser, have a major contribution, are making a major contribution to our work on catalytic systems. So this is just one illustration. Let's use these and other fantastic techniques and facilities. Let's use all the digital facilities available to us. I mentioned during my talk, the work that my team does using computational modeling techniques. We develop software such as the QMMM methods, which we're developing with colleagues. So, Darsbury and uh, Bristol. Um, but computational modeling, which was a speciality in catalytic science, is now dispersed throughout the discipline. You go to a conference on catalysis, you'll find well over half the papers uh, will be making use of computational methods. But there's much more to digital technologies. We've got computer modeling, but now we have the fantastic tools of AI and machine learning. And these digital technologies will be absolutely vital to our field. But then my third point was we need to collaborate. And I'm just going to mention here two initiatives that I think this center can interact with. Uh, the first is this Innovative Center for Applied Sustainable Technologies, ICAST. And again, thank you to Matthew Davidson for letting me have this slide. It's a new 70 million Research England funded center, partners you see, universities, catapults. LEPs and investors, a lot of company members. And this is just starting. It's being led very much by University of Bath and University of Oxford. This is the kind of initiative that we need to interact with. And let me say a few words about the UK Catalysis Hub that I've mentioned during this talk, because the hub, I think, will have should must have strong interactions with the CE Centre. Uh, this is a current structure of the UK Catalysis Hub. It's got a core component led by Graham Hutchings, and then it's got three scientific themes. The first is optimizing, predicting, and designing new catalysts, which I lead. This is based on the Harwell Compass. Catalysis at the Water Energy Nexus, led by Chris Hardacre in Manchester, and catalysis for the circular economy and sustainable manufacturing. But of course, these different themes all interact with each other. And let me finish with just some more details about the Science 3 Catalysis for the Circular Economy and Sustainable Manufacturing, led by Mark Davidson. And this, of course, is based on the premise that catalysis is central to the circular economy of keeping molecules in play. Using waste CO2, plastics, recycling, re reuse, bio-based resources, non-toxic, and abundant additives. And here we highlight some of the current projects. I'll not go through them all, but you will see how re very relevant they are. Sustainable hydrogenation catalysts, reframing plastic waste as a resource, CO2 to methanol via a catalytic membrane reactor, um, catalytic upgrading of cardiff. So really, really very relevant projects. So again, Catalysis Hub is an initiative with which the CE can collaborate. So I'd just like to conclude uh, with acknowledgements. I'd like to thank the people who helped me put the talk together, Matt Davidson, Adiza Azapaji, Nick Dummer, and Jack Pilkington. I'd like to thank the people whose science I've referred to, Konstantinos, Sinalipur Yazdi, Michael Hyam, Justin Hargreaves, Graham Hutchings. I'd like to thank the CE Hub team for their leadership in developing this exciting project, and of course, to UKRI for their
their funding. But finally, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, indeed. So that's really, really uh, informative and insightful this uh, keynote. So I would like to uh, welcome questions from the audience. So if you have any questions addressed to Richard, please use the Q&A uh, function in the Zoom. So Richard, we have received a few questions so far. So if I can just read out these questions and uh, if we can uh, uh, answer them. So the first is from Christina. Uh, Thank you, Professor Catlow, for your presentation. Uh, so she has a question concerning the use of uh, renewable energy. Is it really possible to use only renewable energy for energy consuming processes uh, in the future? Well, it's a very important and very general question. Um, we're not going to be able to move to renewable energy overnight. But we will be able, to, I believe, to transition over a period of 20, 30 years to a system that is predominantly renewable. I mean, others may wish to comment on this, um, but I mean, need to emphasize this is a process that will have to be staged. We are dependent at present on, to a large extent, on fossil fuels, and we cannot turn those off. But we do need, over the next 20, 30 years to move to an energy system that is predominantly renewable. But thank you for the question. It really is a very important one. Okay, thank, thank you, Richard. So the next question is from Jeremy. So uh, Professor Catalo, you mentioned two routes to renewable polymers. One is through the uh, bio-oxygenate and the other is from bio-hydrocarbons. Uh, so which might be the preferred routes considering like the yield, uh, product performance, etc. Well, again, it's a good question. I don't think you can give any kind of definitive answer. I think all I, I mean, I mean, thanks for the question. What I would say is that what you need to do again is to do the LCA, depending on the particular process that you're doing. If you do the LCA, that will guide you as to which route is going to be preferred. So. Let me emphasize that. LCA, absolutely vital in this field. But I mean, thanks for the question. And uh, that, is, that is saying, my response is depending on the problem, this will depend on the system, the problem. And to answer the question, you will need to do LCA. Yes. Thank you again, uh, Richard. So the next question is from Chung. So uh, thank you, Professor Catalog, for the very informative and inspiring talk. Uh, Chun has a question regarding the novel catalysis or catalyst for low temperature ammonium synthesis, which contains like critical metals of cobalt. Uh, is it possible to achieve the same target without using uh, other catalysts that do, do not contain cobalt? Excellent question. And the answer to that question is this is work in progress. Um, uh, Together with Justin Hargreaves, Bill David, we currently have, in fact, an EPSRC funded project that is just started and aims to do just that, to try and find alternative, building on the knowledge that we've obtained from the work on the, the cobalt molybdenum nitride, trying to find alternative transition metal nitride systems that will operate via this dissociative mechanism. So very, very good question. And I say, work in progress. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next question is from uh, Marlon. Thank you for your uh, in, for this insightful presentation. How do you envisage the role of surface engineering te technologies for green chemistry? Well, I think sorry, surface engineering technologies. Surface engineering techniques, yes. I think there'll be key importance. Um, as I said at the end of my talk, we need to use all the relevant techniques that we have. And I think those techniques will be very important in the field. So thanks for that question. Okay, so the next question is from Jeff. Uh, Professor Catalo, thank you very much for your presentation. Green chemistry is a, a broad term. How do you, how does your work influence the proposed government chemical strategy and its aim in embarrassing green chemistry and how is the the ce hub linked to the government chief scientist network so there's an effective uh, science policy engagement 
So probably I can answer the, the, the second part, like the CE hub, but uh, Richard, if we can like uh, discuss how the green, your, your work influences the, the upcoming like government chemical strategy, that would be uh, good. Well, <laughs> I mean, we aim to, I think this is actually is more the quite honest thing. I mean, it's a good question. I think it's more of a question for the panel discussion yeah. uh, as to how we influence policy. What I can say is that we have a number of routes um, for, in particular routes, for instance, by the Council for Science and Technology, routes by the Government Office of uh, Science and Technology. And I can tell you that they really do listen. Uh, in the Royal Society, we have a very effective policy team. Uh, they have actually recently produced a whole set of briefings uh, relating to the role of net zero. Those briefings are being um, are beginning, I think, to have influence with policymakers. So, um, you know, it's not a simple question, but I think policymakers are listening at present to scientific needs in this area. And it's a job for all of us to do. But I mean, over to you, Jin, perhaps to give uh, your perspective. Yes, indeed, fully agree with you, Richard. So uh, Jeff, regarding your, your second part of the question, how the CE Hub is linked to the government chief scientists uh, network. I mean, we are very working closely with uh, different uh, departments of, of the government. For example, from the proposal shaping stage, we, we I mean, for example, DEFRA is playing a very important role, but now since all the centers are, are developing and the, the, the CE Hub is coordinating some policy uh, engagement with different uh, departments, such as uh, not only DEFRA, but also ACE, Environment Agency, etc. So you will hear a bit more on the insights of uh, how we work with policymakers in, in the panel discussion later. Okay, so uh, because of the time, I can see there's a lot of co questions coming. Probably I can only take two more. Uh, so the next from Greg, uh, do you see a significant role for direct air capture CO2 in the future? Is this a key part of a circular economy? I think the answer to that question is yes, I do see a significant role for direct air capture. There are a lot of issues surrounding direct air capture. I'd be very interested to have Peter Styron's view, but I think developing the direct air capture technologies is going to be an important part of achieving a circular economy. But I would appreciate other comments there. So sure. thanks for raising it. I think it's an absolutely key point. Great. So I think we can discuss this a little bit more in the, in the panel discussion. Again, Peter will be one of the panel members. So I will take the last question. So I, I saw there's more questions coming. So you can also save the questions to the panel discussion, which uh, we'll, well, we will start very soon. So uh, the, the, the last question from uh, one from Lin. Uh, thank you for the informative talk. How about the energy efficiency in CO2 recycle compared to the hydrogen economy that move away from the carbon-based energy route? So could you comment a little bit? Here, Richard. CO2 hydrogenation, we need because we need carbon based products. Um, that is why I was emphasizing the important role of CO2 hydrogenation. We need carbon based chemicals. I actually do think that CO2 to fuels is going to be an important component of the future fuel and energy mix. But as well as developing fuels, we need CO2 chemistry in order to, we need CO2 as a source of carbon to develop carbon-based products. But again, it's a very good question and one that I think we could discuss in the panel. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for your time in, in giving us that very insightful keynotes and also taking questions from the audience. Well, thanks very much for the questions because nearly all the questions raised major issues that we could have discussed for a long time. Exactly, exactly. So hopefully some of the conversation can be continued uh, in the panel discussion. So let's move to the uh, next uh, part of, of, of this uh, event. Again, thank you much, very much, uh, Richard. Uh, so, so then we will now move into our panel discussion with our academic and industrial leaders on the topic of 
the relationships and nexus between circular chemical economy and net zero. So uh, the panel will be chaired by Dr. Shina Hinoka. Uh, Shina is a, is a knowledge transfer manager in the materials chemistry at KTM. So she's also the chair of the strategic advisory board of our center. So Shina got her PhD from Imperial College in 2013. After that, she moved into industry as a research scientist at Johnson Massey and late took a project management role there. And Shina joined KTN as a knowledge transfer manager in 2019 in the chemistry and industrial biotechnology team. Her current area of interest including uh, catalysis, hydrogen batteries, sustainable aviation fuels, alternative feedstocks, again, very much fit with the uh, remit of our center. She is also working across government, industry, and academia to, in the, to identify strategically important areas for the UK and the develop recommendations for intervention. So without further ado, so I will hand over to Sheena to start the panel discussion. Thanks very much, Jin, um, for that really nice introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to be here this morning to sort of combine this uh, and lead this panel, which consists of industry and academia to discuss a really important topic. So morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As Jin said, I'm Sheena Hindocha from KTN's Chemistry and Industrial Biotechnology team. If you haven't heard of us at KTN, uh, we create diverse connections to drive positive change, and that is impacting environment, society, and the economics across the UK. I'm really pleased to be here today, and we've got a really great panel lined up to talk to you. So we're just going to crack on with some introductions before we get into the questions. If you do have any questions for the panel, please pop them in the Q&A box and we'll pick them up as we go along. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Professor Peter Styron from the University of Sheffield. Thanks, Sheena. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, from the University of Sheffield, Professor of Chemical Engineering and Chemistry, and also uh, an Associate Fellow in the Understanding of Politics at the Sir Bernard Crick Centre. Um, so, I also head the Styring Group, as the name suggests, and I've got a very talented team of people working on life cycle assessment, techno-economics, social impact analysis, policy development, and even direct air capture, as uh, one of the questions came up. We have a meeting tomorrow where we're looking to install uh, a plan. I also work with Unilever as part of their uh, home care program on uh, clean uh, clean future uh, and you'll hear about more about that later. Uh, this center is so important. Um, we, we have to move now. It, it's a case of reuse it or lose it. Um, we, we really need to uh, push the boundaries of what we're doing and the importance of life cycle assessment uh, as Richard said is absolutely paramount. Uh, and my group, together with the Global CO2 Initiative, have started to work on the harmonised guidelines for life cycle assessment across CO2 utilisation, which can be transposed to any other technology as well. Once you have the methodology and you know the boundaries, then that can be universal. So looking forward to this discussion. Uh, so thanks, Sheena. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, so next, I'd like Bing Zhu from, the, from Harriet Watt University to, to talk to us for a little minute. Morning everyone, my name is Bing Xu and I am an Associate Professor in Finance at uh, the uh, Heritage Watch uh, University. Uh, it is my great pleasure to join today's panel discussion. Uh, my research is around banking and finance, energy economics and decision analysis. Um, I have been worked on several multidisciplinary energy projects and super excited to see my experience in business and finance and can also play an active role in those technology centers and projects. For our center, um, I lead on theme three, policy, society and finance, in which we aim to provide the stakeholder co-created knowledge on barriers, challenges and opportunities to enable a successful transition to circular chemical economy. Uh, around the four main aspects. So first of all, we need to understand and how business create, deliver and capture values by advancing circularity. And secondly, it is well known that improved circularity cannot be achieved without substantial level of finance. And despite the strong momentum in the investment community, there's still a huge financing gap. 
So we're very interested in, in finding out how we can mobilize a private investment. And thirdly, beside the business and the finance community, it is critical to understand the public's um, perceptions of and responses to circular chemical products. And I, uh, we believe that increased uh, uh, attention and, and positive attitudes and towards those assembled products could uh, and possibly influence the market momentum, stimulate demand and supply. And finally, uh, we would like to highlight areas that require some government interventions, identify effective and policy to uh, uh, accelerate and the circular uh, chemical transition. So I look forward to working with everyone uh, over the next few years and together we'll be able to identify the problems as well and also deliver real world and, uh, solutions to overcome some of those uh, obstacles. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks very much, Bing. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Dave Robson uh, from NEPIC to talk to us for a minute. Good morning, everyone. Um, Dave Robson, Technical Director at NEPIC. Um, NEPIC's a cluster organization for the process sector in the Northeast. So we, we work with industry um, and the supply chain and industry has, has worked quite hard over many years to reduce environmental impacts. I think one thing, if we look back, we've made an awful lot of progress. The problem with that is it means the stuff which remains to do is much harder. And that's where working together and looking at a range of technologies and also some of the, the business models and the finance implications around that is so critical. Thanks, yeah. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, next on our panel, we have Louise Keller at Roper from Bankers for Net Zero. Hi, thank you. I'm really pleased to be here. So I am the CEO of Volans, which is a small boutique uh, think tank and strategic advisory. We work with multinationals on transformation across sectors like chemicals, energy fuels, infrastructure, retail and banking. Um, clients like um, Neste, Novartis, Athiona, Covestro, Unilever, Selfridges Group, Rakuten, so quite wide. I've spent most of my career uh, working in businesses or with businesses on innovation strategy and in particular on circular economy business models. Um, and then I've got involved more and more with um, Global CO2 initiative that Peter mentioned on the carbon capture and use acceleration. And I'm also co-founder of the Bankers for Net Zero initiative where we bring together banks, industry and policymakers to unlock kind of capital flows that are needed to really finance net zero here in the UK. So I'm particularly interested in that intersection between science, industry, um, finance and policy. Thank you. Excellent, thanks very much Louise. And uh, lastly but not least on our panel, we have Ian Howell from Unilever. Uh, good morning, everybody. So uh, I'm Ian Howell. I'm a material science director for Unilever. Unilever is one of the sort of world's largest fast moving consumer goods companies with a very large footprint in the UK. Um, our interest or my interest is very much, uh, as you can see behind me, delivering our clean future ambitions and Unilever's purpose of making sustainable living commonplace. So uh, for home care, a, bi a billion people use our products every day. Um, and to Richard's point earlier on, if those materials and products that we use aren't circular and aren't sustainable, then we really are letting down the future society. So it's all we're looking after today, but not after tomorrow. And so we've called out as Unilever that we will be net zero by 2039 in scope one, two and three emissions, which is incredibly uh, challenging, but nevertheless something we have to do. Um, we've also called out that by 2030, we will have no fossil carbon or virgin fossil carbon derived materials in our products in home care. Um, again, all of this points us towards a world with circular um, carbon at its core, um, and that's sort of that's my uh, interest in this centre. I should also declare an interest. I chair um, a, a group with the Chemistry Council in the UK. Um, some of you may not have heard of the Chemistry Council, but look it up on, on Google. Uh, so the Chemistry Council also has a Sustainable Materials for Consumer Products group. Uh, it's a cross-industry group that is really driving on, on how do we in the UK deliver a sustainable materials um, um, industry. So, so that's my interest and who I am. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Ian. And thank you all for joining us this morning. I really like that we've got such a diverse mix of perspectives on this topic. So hopefully we'll get into some good discussion. I can already see some questions coming in, which 
delve into some of the detail quite quickly and um, keep those coming in and we'll pick them up as we go but I'd like to take chair's prerogative and just start with a couple of high level scene setting questions so we can get some different perspectives on the topic so just going to go to peter first can you explain from your perspective why we should be moving towards a circular economy for chemicals well, the, the, the reason, in my opinion, is that we've been moving on the linear path for far too long. And in fact, if you go back to, I think it's 1979, Ad Lansing in the uh, Dutch government said we have to adopt a waste hierarchy. So the first thing is avoid. So don't produce the waste in the first place. The worst thing you can do is landfill. So in between that, you have energy use, but you also have recycle uh, and reuse. So if you look at the IEA report and the IPCC report, they say we have to stop using fossil carbon. Not we should, we have to stop using it. And if we need carbon. So we need a replacement. And the only way to do that is to recycle it. So I think uh, we, we have a duty to the planet, to society uh, and to grandchildren to, uh, to, to use the carbon we have and not waste it. So uh, someone mentioned Back to the Future. We, we did this in uh, uh, the APPG, the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Energy Studies. You have to look back before you can look forward. And you know, if we look back to rationing, if we look back to austerity, uh, we, we, if we don't act now, we'll get into a much worse situation. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks very much, Peter. And Bing, I'd like to bring you in here um, to consider your views. Yeah, uh, thanks, Gina. Um, so yes, um, I definitely echo with Jean, uh, Professor Sir Richard Catlow and um, Peter. So the chemical sector is incredibly important to the UK economy. And um, we've seen that this is the second largest manufacturing industry by value added. It offers an over 150,000 direct jobs across 3,600 companies. However, despite its importance and the current industry is highly linear and um, we still, business still, uh, using the take, make and dispose approach. And um, we cannot continue on the business as usual scenario. And moving towards a circular chemical economy is not an option, um, a, but an inevitable, uh, inevitable uh, uh, response to a growing demand and, and addressing UK's emission assessable growth. And we need to rethink our production consumption system. And this can uh, not only uh, reduce the dependency on imported virgin uh, petrochemical feedstocks and also uh, uh, reduce reliance on waste, waste storage or exports and contributing to uh, some of the relevant uh, national targets such as net zero and 2050 year uh, environment plan. And I believe, I think and, uh, we also need to establish a regular assessment to track progress as well. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Bing. And, and Ian, I'd like to come to you because we've already mentioned Unilever's massive ambitions within this space. You clearly believe as a company and an individual how we should move forward. So I guess not just around why we should move forward, but what is the biggest opportunity for you that Unilever see in this space? Yeah, so I think again, I come at this from a from from the business angle, if you like, which maybe people don't think about too much. So I have a number in front of me, which is sort of staring me out. So in the heart of the coronavirus crisis last year, Unilever did a global survey um, to ask about consumers, what, what were the things that worried them most? Um, and actually, the figure that came back, which astonished us, was 71% of the population that we sampled said that climate change was as serious as COVID, right in the middle of the COVID crisis. Uh, and we were surprised. Um, and actually, there are many surveys like this. So plastic waste, climate change are the biggest global environmental concerns that, pe that people have. And I think the thing that's shifted is people now realise it's about them. It's not this thing about the planet which is going on out there. It affects me. Um, and, that, and that translates through to consumer purchase. So consumers will frequently tell us, if you're doing a good job on the environment, we will consider buying your product. You still have to have performance and you still have to be affordable, but we will at least consider buying your product if you're doing a good job on the environment. If you're not, then something like 78% of consumers say, we have stopped using a product because it did something wrong for the planet. Um, so it's incredibly important from a business perspective that these commitments we've made as Unilever absolutely make business sense. Um, and circularity, as Richard pointed out, if it translates through to climate change and if it translates through to water and all these other things that consumers concern about, 
is absolutely business it's business sense so that's why i'm um it, it, it's a no it really is kind of it absolutely makes logical sense to do this um, yeah those numbers are amazing actually I, I never thought they would be be that high but it's, that's incredible and also brilliant that consumers are moving in that direction and helping drive drive the change and um, so i guess we've heard through those perspectives about the opportunities but maybe we could touch a little bit on the challenges around this we've heard some of those through richard's brilliant presentation um Dave, I just from a kind of a cluster and an epic perspective, what do you see as the biggest challenges that are associated in moving towards this circular chemicals economy? I actually see a few challenges. Some of them are quite obvious in terms of a change needed in the business models, because we're going from a, a structure where a lot of the, the linear um, use, a lot of that was actually funded and paid for by different bodies such as the extraction of the materials and the waste disposal, whereas circular economy may well be overall cheaper, definitely better for the environment, but a lot of those costs are focusing back on the manufacturers. So challenges being able to address that and, and for industry to remain cost competitive. I think equally there's a huge reliance on people at the end of the life cycle, being able to put those back into a recycling mechanism so that they can then be taken forward and used um, as, again, raw materials and intermediates. I think also we have a lot of challenges around taking the, the work that's been done, not just the work we're talking about doing in the future, but work that's historically been done and actually implementing it, moving it forward and actually deploying and gaining the benefits from it. Yeah, thank you very much. Dave. Um, Louise, I'd like to bring you in here from a kind of funding and investment perspective, because that must be one of the biggest challenges that you see within this space. Yeah, no, absolutely. And just to echo what Dave said, that fund, the early funding is always the challenge when you try and establish a, a circular business model, because overall it should pan out for the better, but you have to have that early funding. And I think right now, um, as an economy in the UK, you know, we need innovation and and to scale up, we need a push for um, for funding and for policy, actually, to 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 create an environment that is a secure um, so people know what's coming in terms of policy. You know, we've had some of the national commitments to net zero and so on, but not really to a circular economy. So it's, that's a little bit interesting. And then secondly, um, you know the 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 funding um, and where government funding can help until we've scaled to a point where private funding can can come in. But there's some new funding models um, in terms of blended finance that definitely will be needed and and are coming into play here. I would say. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, Bing, do you have any perspectives on the the challenges that are faced in this? Indeed, yes, thank you very much um, uh, for bringing in. Um, this is actually one of the key questions that uh, we're very interested in finding out by ourselves and uh, what are the perceived barriers to uh, the circular economy from different stakeholders' perspective, because obviously a different um, a group of stakeholders have different worries and concerns. And also that more importantly, how can our centre to address some of these um, barriers? As Jim mentioned, that um, our centre is acts as a platform to bridge um, the gap among academia practitioners and, and uh, policymakers and providing evidence and basic recommendation that's um, uh, of interest to wider uh, communities. And so I just want to share a, a little bit to know what we've done so far. And um, uh, so we've asked the same question <laughs> to, in two of our uh, workshops in March. And the first one is organized by uh, RAP and UKPP, uh, which is the UK Plastic Pack uh, Working Group. And the second one is at our center industry engagement and uh, uh, lunch workshop. And so we've we, we've collected and quite a lot of um, uh, opinions and from, or from from participants and and few you know like and there's uh, as Dave and and um, Luis and uh, mentioned there's and some of the obvious ones such as technical side and there are barriers around creating new. Uh, chemical recycling process and uh, there's also barriers around feedstock availability quality and competition uh, from other sectors and and then uh, how can we upscale and sometimes downscale some of those and technologies and that also be mentioned and 
And um, um, the other thing that um, is in terms of complexity of changes and to business and uh, in building a new uh, value chains, because obviously that um, uh, transition to a circular economy, it will induce so many changes to the system and how business and, and you know, to deal with those and, uh, risk versus rewards and effectively is an important question. And then uh, the other two things being repeatedly mentioned and is economics of viability and is a, a crucial barrier. There is the country lack of infrastructure, oil price volatility, and then as long as well combined with some fiscal availability, quality, all of these and could affecting the business viability in, in terms of the investment. And, and then policy again is a, a critical, uh, is a critical uh, barrier as well. Okay. So what does enable? <laughs> Thanks very much, Bing. Um, so we've mentioned consumers already, and I can see that there's a couple of questions have come in regarding consumers. So maybe we could just spend a couple of minutes specifically thinking about consumer knowledge and awareness. Um, I'll pick up the questions from the Q&A in a second, but I guess, Peter, from your perspective, how important is that consumer knowledge and awareness? And how do we develop and create these new markets whilst informing them of where their products come from and the impact that they have? No, that, that really is an important question. And you know, we, we've done lots of studies over many years, particularly in the CO2 utilization market. Uh, and it's very easy as scientists to fall into the trap that people should know this. Uh, and it's the case that people don't know it and we, we just don't communicate well enough. So we, we have Libby Gibson who uh, from Newcastle who's working on uh, communication strategy and engagement. And, and it's not it's not public engagement, it's public acceptance. It's, it's getting the public to accept what we're doing and realizing that it's good for them. Uh, what, what, on, on CO2 utilization, Covestro make a, uh, a polyurethane, so a recycled CO2 into a plastic which is used in mattresses. People worry that they might asphyxiate, they might stop breathing because the CO2 might come out of the polymer because they don't know the chemistry. Uh, and, and that brings us back to policy as well. Uh, because things are changing, but five years ago, a lot of politicians had no scientific background. Um, and, and it's a case of educating the, uh, the politicians, both in terms of the technology and the economic and social benefit for the country. And it's no surprise that, you know, one of Britain's greatest achievements in the last year has been the vaccine rollout. And Nadim Zahawi is a chemical engineer. So just take that on board. <laughs> Um, that's pretty. And Peter, just to follow on from that, who do you think should take on the responsibility of that communication? Is it all of us within this community, scientists, industry, government, in order to help support that communication? How how do we ensure that it happens um, in the pace that it needs to happen? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. It, it is interdisciplinary, as the title suggests. And um, yeah, I'm going to shout out to uh, Louise again on uh, Bankers for Net Zero and. I joined an APPG on fairer business banking, which I know nothing about banking, but I've learned a lot in the, in the year that I've been on that. And you get politicians, I, I propose this quadruple helix model where you have politicians, academics, industry and finance all working together because the more strands you put into that helix, the stronger it is and the more understanding there is. So absolutely important that we do work interdisciplinarily Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. And um, of course, I'd like to bring in Ian here, since we're talking about consumers. Um, I guess in your perspective on how we can start communicating and the importance of that, uh, raising awareness and knowledge of the consumer. Yeah, I think I'd start actually by consumers, again, looking at data in front of me, consumers want to behave sustainably. That, that, not all of them, but the, the vast proportion of consumers, 70 odd percent, want to behave sustainably. That's a sort of global um, market trend that we see. The, the point for some is they aren't able to. And in, and in part, that's down to the affordability of the technology. So particularly in my sector, if I'm if I'm given a choice between a detergent which costs twice as much, am I really going to buy the one which is sustainable? So right back to the conversation with, with catalysts, making these technologies affordable such that consumers can do the behavior that they want to do is absolutely critical. I think then is the, is the technology acceptable? Absolutely it is. So we've done, we've done a lot of work looking at what we call the carbon rainbow. So these different sources of carbon, whether it be plant-based or, or bio-derived or 
from CO2, C1 capture, utilisation, or, or even the chemical recycling into chemicals. Our initial work suggests globally people are really embracing those technologies, even waste, even waste into, into um, detergent, where we sort of said, really, people aren't going to go for that. They're embracing it. Now, what, what the gap is, they're saying, we, we like the idea, we don't believe you can do it. Mm-hmm. So, it, so the technology is acceptable, but it's not believable. Um, and so that's the next piece is this the kind of this continuing education. And I think, again, we through our company, through our brand, brand communication, we can actually start bringing this in, into people's homes. Um, and that's a sort of big role that we have to play. Um, we demoed a, a product in China a few weeks ago where we have a laundry detergent made from captured CO2. And that just gets the whole dialogue with the consumers going because all of a sudden, well, it must be believable because it's here. I'm using it. It's in my hands. Um, it's not affordable today but it gets the dialogue going to, um, to, to make things happen. So, so that's where we are. Brilliant, that's really interesting. And just staying with you, Ian, because we've had a question come in um, from the audience that has asked about the confusion amongst consumers around biodegradable plastics and also how biodegrad- biodegradability plays within the circular economy. Um, just wonder if you've got some perspectives on that. Yeah, so I should yeah, so I should call out I my my expertise is in the chemicals that go into the pot, the bottle rather than the chemistry of the bottle itself. <laughs> so so again, if I if I talk about biodegradable ingredients, I, I, again the first thing is I think a lot of people don't really think about what happens to a product in my sector if it's a shampoo or detergent. Once I've used it, what happens? What's the fate? Um, and what happens, of course, is ideally those materials go into the sewage treatment and they do biodegrade so that they go, they biodegrade to CO2, they biodegrade to biomass and they biodegrade to water. And, and you hope that therefore there is no um, contamination of water as a consequence. Um, but of course, then you've got the link back. So there, that's where the CO2 comes from in my business. If you, if you, if you forget about the energy consumption used in the manufacture, which I'll park as a another job to be done that embedded carbon which then generates co2 at end of use um, that's the link back and then that takes us into the world of peter with well can i capture carbon dioxide and make that a a completely probably in in the in the circular economy models we saw earlier on it's really at the outside of that loop of um, of, of of what's going on but that's the bit that we're trying to drive um, that's great thanks Ian and Dave I don't know if within your cluster this kind of biodegradability um, issue and how we talk about it with as consumers if you've got any perspectives from um, from your side Um, not directly but some of our manufacturers are down the chain in terms of bottle manufacture so they are very much looking towards how can they um, increase the recyclability how can they use recycled plastics in the supply chain? Um, and I think it's an interesting one. Um, when you start talking about biodegradable, to some extent, you do lose some of that recyclability because it is actually degrading and it makes it much harder to get that back into a circular chain. Some of the things which have been talked about in terms of degrading purely to, to, to CO2, you know. Yes, there's, there's interesting you know, comments and it might fit in with what Peter was saying about direct air capture. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's a quandary we, we, we need to face. And I'm not sure it's a quandary industry and scientists m- may be able to answer alone. I think it involves a lot of different you know, disciplines to understand which is the best way. We know what we want to do, but in the short term, which is the most productive way of, of getting there? Mm. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Dave. And just I'm going to stay on. Oh, Bing, you wanted to come in there. So I was just trying to unmute myself. Yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so it's really interesting point about consumer knowledge and awareness and uh, their role in developing and creating new markets. And indeed, that uh, we're working together with RAP and then to gauge and uh, to understand and uh, consumers and uh, knowledge and then their acceptance and their perceived benefits and um, concerns of and uh, of those and products and 
So, and then it ultimately uh, is an, um, the willingness to pay. <laughs> and so I, I, I think all of this um, is very, very important. And, and, and another thing that I would like to highlight and um, is actually the financial uh, literacy is also quite, it's very, very important. And, and I, th I think there is a need to, to arise more awareness and knowledge about, and, and also more discussions about our savings and pensions and investments and to connect to the minds and of citizens and between the need for action for companies in their uh, savings and pension products. And I think this is general, not necessarily just a circular economy, because quite often that how could, you know, how should your pension be invested? And in the UK, there are 2.6 billion or trillion uh, invested and in the UK pension. Much of those funds goes into industries such as fossil fuels and tobacco and, and arms and gambling and, and uh, uh, contributing also contributing to deforestation. So there's, I think there's an urgent need for all the, for example, the pension funds tell the savers and how their money is invested and, and what means for people and planet and, and then uh, what have they done to take in the environmental, social and governance risk into account and ensure their portfolios are consistent in line with the Paris Agreement. I think and, uh, this is an, uh, another, different set of uh, consumer or like an, uh, consumer knowledge and awareness. Mm, I can I can see Louise is uh, wanting to come in on that as well. Louise. Yeah. Can I just add it to some really, really interesting points. And what's just struck me is we, every company, scientists, the government, um, NGOs, we haven't mentioned NGOs very much, are all important in educating consumers. And it feels like there are two levels. One is it has to be super simple. And Ian's example about um, a detergent um, showing, you know, having a simple example that's very tangible is one hugely important piece because you, know, you can get mattresses, you can get vodka, again, very expensive. Nobody's really scaling it yet. So that's one piece. But the other piece, which links to, again, I'm going to point at Unilever and sort of purposeful companies, is that telling the story of the system what happens with biodegradability, uh, you know, the fact that there is a circular system and, and where your money goes is, is going to fund something, it, all that, if we can convey that circular piece in an easier way to consumers, I think that's, that's the next step. So one is examples and two is, this is a systems challenge. And actually the best way to talk about a systems challenge is to have a joint goal, which 71% of consumers want to solve climate change, at least, <laughs> and certainly the next generations do. So, so let's use that to, sh to, to shift the thinking so it's not just a product, but it's, it's the whole system that they're helping to contribute to. Yeah, um, I feel like we could talk about consumers for a lot, a lot longer. No, it's really great discussion. Thank you all. Um, and I can see that there's a couple of other questions come in, but there's a couple of other big juicy topics that we wanted to touch on. And I'm very conscious of the time to make sure that we give them um, policy and waste um, equal uh, measure. But just wanted to, because um, we've mentioned direct air capture a couple of times throughout the conversation so far, and there has a, been a question come in from the audience around this. So. Um, this is from Phil. He says, shouldn't the methanol economy from DAC to CO2 be supported by government and UKRI as much as the hydrogen economy has been supported? Because methanol plus direct uh, methanol fuel cells is a more sensible way of closing the carbon cycle for fuels than compressed hydrogen. So, um, yeah, I guess it's the, uh, the question is asking about the balance between supporting the methanol economy versus the hydrogen economy. I don't know, Peter, if you've got a perspective on this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I, it's really important. I, I think too much emphasis is on the hydrogen economy. Hydrogen is incredibly important, but as a vector, everything is an energy vector. So it's difficult to store electricity, except diurnally because batteries discharge. Yeah, you know, my car sat outside, it's had diesel sat in it for six months, the battery's dead. So the diesel will stay there. I think methanol is a great economy. I would also look at the synthetic fuels economy. And you know, as Richard will know, we contributed towards the Royal Society report on synth synthetic transport fuels. Um, if, you, if you take, looking at methanol, if you take the methanol fuel cells, you have to redesign the car. And I know a lot of work is going on in redesigning cars, but this brings in policy. It brings in direct air capture. Uh, and it also brings in the social aspects. Because as we abolish combustion engine vehicle, new combustion engine vehicles by 2030, there's still going to be a legacy 
of old combustion engines going diesel will go till 2050, 2060. Uh, and we run a risk of creating a social underclass that people can't afford to run electric cars. The life cycle assessment on electric vehicles is not good. If you buy a big EV, it's, you might as well buy a small diesel uh, because the full life cycle assess assessment over the whole system is so difficult. Uh, but, but direct air capture coupled with synthetic fuels, I think that is the real future in the short term. And remember, this is a transition. This is not 2030, we all start, we all go electric. There is gonna be a transition and we're, we need to fuel that transition, but we, fuels maybe not the best word, but we need to ease that transition uh, so that we, we don't create ourselves more problems. And yeah, you know, I, I think direct air capture will come, come up later, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's really important that we do look at that. Excellent, thank you, Peter. And, and Ian, I think you might have a, a opinion on this as well. Yeah, I just wanted to reinforce this link between we have a sort of uh, um, an issue in the UK of sectorizing fuels and chemicals as two separate different things. And yet when you go back, the underpinning science and the underpinning technologies are identical. Um, and so I'm already running into, I have to say not in the UK, but in the EU, I'm running into, into collaborations with partners where they're saying, look, I'll give an example. We are making benzene. Okay, I want sustainable benzene. We have it, but you can't have it because we're feeding it back into our crackers because it's more value adding to make it into fuel because of the incentives of the fuel economy that aren't there for chemicals. In the UK, we've got a chance to get that right <laughs> so that we can incentivize both the fuels and the chemicals. Um, so I just wanted to add that, um, that piece to the puzzle because the science we've got is brilliant, but let's just not fixate on fuel. Um, yeah, because they're all chemical molecules and it's how we use them that's, that's yeah. the point. Um, yeah. And you know, again, my, my existing supply chain today, I, I source my hydrocarbons from a tanker of kerosene. I take the cut of the kerosene that the aviation guys don't want because it freezes at too high a temperature. And that's a non-branched kerosene molecule, which then forms a detergent. And I want it because it's the non-branched materials which biodegrade. So there's a win-win in the current sort of symbiotic relationship, which we, if we can get it right, we can build it into the sustainable aviation fuels and chemicals in the future. Um, it's, up, it's there to be had, kind of. <laughs> yeah, it's a massive synerg synergistic interdisciplinary opportunity. Um, thanks for pointing that out, it's brilliant. Um, so we have just mentioned their incentives on fuel. So I'm just going to move on to the policy and incentivization and kind of that whole approach and how actually policy can support this move towards a circular economy. So Bing, I know that you've been doing some work on this. Uh, yes, and um, uh, yes, I, I am the same leader on uh, policy in three, um, but actually uh, Peter is the one <laughs> doing most of the work. So uh, but I think um, policy plays a critical role in moving uh, towards a circular chemical um, economy to accelerate and supply uh, more sustainable products and changing demand uh, behavior and also uh, enhancing investments. And obviously the question is how can we uh, turn effective policy ideas into action to facilitate an orderly transition? So I, I believe, and obviously we need to look into from both and supply and demand side and on the supply side that we need to understand what motivated and, and as well as what prevented and business to engage with an, a circular principle for example, um, quite a lot of the thing we've heard in this and um, uh, the manufacturing product through the circular economy based uh, practice, a lack of uh, financial uh, feasibility relative uh, in relation to the uh, linear products and uh, costs are much more expensive than uh, if we just actually buy from the virgin material. Um, so uh, I guess and there is then that there isn't an, any incentive because obviously um, so we need to uh, to look at um, the policy intervention for example um, there's been VAT relief being talked about for reused um, products and uh, for those and having a certain percentage um, of recycled and um, content for instance uh, and also that um, uh, how can we facilitate development of a uh, circular trading platform for example. And the other uh, enabler obviously um, um, come down to financing and then how can we offer easy access to finance for innovation, circularity. Maybe we need to uh, more have more low interest or zero interest for circular projects and other uh, tailored made and financial products. And, and in the UK, we've been talking about mandates and for disclosure of climate related information, TCFD. 
and how can you know obviously uh, or besides the internally uh, external funding source and how can business and to do more especially those profitable ones for instance um, and I think and uh, I think in all of these points and are, are really really important as I mentioned Peter is our uh, policy guru <laughs> in the center and then he has made many uh, engagements and I'm sure he has a lot more to add on to this thank you Peter would you like to add any any comments yeah uh, just a few so um I I've just written a report for which is going in APPG uh, energy studies uh, and the tagline is follow the science not the sheep. Uh, a lot of policy at the moment is they're doing this so we'll do the same and, and they're really not looking at the whole picture. It's a symbiotic environment and I'll, I'll just give you one example. I, I always like using props so there you go. Ubiquitous in the last year hand sanitizer. Okay that's made from CO2. But if you look at the whole system, it's made from CO2 that's been got direct air captures. It's actually New York air that's been captured. The hydrogen comes from a few uh, from a um, electrochemical cell where water split to give hydrogen, which goes into making the ethanol, and also oxygen. And we've had a shortage of oxygen. So if you look at the COVID situation, this was actually a vodka company, and they repurposed making vodka into making hand sanitizer. And if anyone says it's not financially viable, they were giving this away free to New York hospitals. But you know, look at the whole system. You have the hand sanitizer, you have the vodka to celebrate at the end of the virus, but you also have the oxygen being produced that can go to help with respiration. So it's a case of policy looking at the whole system and not the silo. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks, Peter. And Dave, from your perspective in kind of an industrial cluster, how can policy support businesses within that? that space move towards this circular economy? I think we've, we've talked about business models and you know, the financial changes and implications, but I think also if you start thinking about some of the policy drivers which are out there, how circular economy can help achieve those. Probably in the last six months, we've probably focused quite significantly on supply chains and securing those supply chains. We've had concerns over Brexit. We've had concerns over COVID we've had lots of different things and if we can keep some of those materials we've already made reuse those as a raw material back into a process then that does help secure some of those supply chains and i think it's understanding the the, the government's drivers and clarity if we are we really bothered about a circular economy or do we want to stop climate change and preserve the environment we have and if so, which is the best tool to do it? We've talked about different tools here, and I don't think there is one silver bullet which will get us to the end solution. We've got to pick the best tool from a quite a wide toolbox and use that one. And sometimes that's where there's conflict or concern of what future policies and um, business models might be. So I think you know it's driving that change in the right way and making sure we, we get what we I think we all want around this table. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks very much, Dave. And um, so just kind of leading on from that, I'm going to pick up a question from Jeff um, that's come in, that's specifically talking about waste and regulation around that. So um, Jeff says chemical recycling straddles different regulatory environments and um, taking waste, waste regulation to product um, reach, UK reach, for example. Is clarity on sector regulation key to attract and de-risk investment? And what needs to happen to ensure optimal regulation for this nascent sector happens? Um, for example, resuming the EA's end of waste service. So I think this is about sort of de-risking investment via regulation. And Louise, I'd like to bring you in here if you've got a... Um, does, the, does that regulation and sort of clarity on what's coming help de-risk investment? No, absolutely. I, I think that's the key. So in the work we've done at Bankers and Net Zero, that is really what keeps coming up in order to transform whole industries. The policy needs to be, and Peter said it, holistic, and it needs to have, a, there needs to be a plan. So it isn't, oh, we have to reach this number by this date. It, it, there has to be ratchet mechanisms to just really incentivize the behavior we want. I thought Dave's point about, do we want a circular economy or do we want to stop climate change is a really, really good one. Because again, it, it's that holistic approach 
and and giving the you know nobody will invest if they don't know what's happening you know nobody will invest if they whether it's hydrogen economy or another economy if they're not sure whether this is going to be punished so many people even consumers got got bitten by buying diesel cars because that was better for the environment now they have to ditch them you know and and of course the science isn't clear necessarily of this is going to last forever but the government has to have a clear policy on these things to give the security I think um, and then again incentivizing systems behavior like being talked about you know how do you create a trading platform just incentivizing those things and then you know everybody you know the funding bit again which is around can you front load market support um, so that you can then crowd in the private support after mm -hmm. There's, there's been a couple of quest related questions that have come in and, and one is around, so how about international agreement on standardizations of assessment um, and does that support an internationalization of the circular economy? I don't know. I, I, I kind of want to point slightly to Peter because that this is where the, the international work on the um, life cycle assessment and, and also techno-economic assessments come in where there has been quite a lot of collaboration um, internationally, but I'm going to point at Peter for the detail. Yeah. <laughs> Peter. Thanks, Louise. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it's really important because, uh, you know, this is a global problem. There, there's no doubt it is a global problem, but th there are different uh, entities within the globe. It's all very well doing that standardization. And yes, we are working on that on the techno-economic side uh, but we have to realize that there are some countries where it will be difficult. Setting the standardization is important, but then we need to look at things like overseas aid and, uh, and, and tariffs for developing countries, because what, what we don't want to do is disadvantage those countries who can't afford to do what we're planning to do, because this is not going to be cheap. Uh, and yeah, uh, Ian at Unilever uh, mentioned the uh, I think the, the 1 billion euro investment by 2030, there's the Elon Musk Foundation, there, there's lots of work going on in pockets. Uh, but we have to realize that, you know, what we do in the US or the UK or Europe is diff different from what can be done in sub-Saharan Africa or uh, in parts of Asia. So we need to be very careful that we're not too prescriptive. Mm. That's great. And I'd like to actually bring Ian in here as a, you know, a representative for a global organisation um, with markets all across the world. Would standardisation support or could that be a hindrance in some some points? Yeah, I think, to, to, again, this is outside of my expertise area, but generally I think sort of prescriptive standardisation often leads you down a path where you end up not having what you want because you suddenly realise later on, oh my goodness, the regulation's driven me in the wrong direction. So I think guidance and standard, in that sense, standardisation and guidance and what to think about is really useful, but reticent sometimes on regulating it and sort of casting it into thou shalt. For example, LCA, you will do an LCA this way regulated, I think would be a disaster. Um, <laughs> a guidance on the sorts of things you should consider as a sort of standard approach, um, spot on. Um, but not really in my, uh, not my field of specialism, that one. Um, excellent. And then I do have a, another question, which um, Ian might be appropriate for you. So um, one around replacing plastics with metals can't metals replace plastics in certain applications? Uh, so the easy answer is yes. Um, so some people will be aware of the loop activities that are going on, um, the various sort of activities looking at a dove has now got a, uh, an antiperspirant that's sold, I think, in a metal can instead of a plastic can um, with a closed loop recycling, hence the loop name. Um, I think there's another question in there about sort of the reuse of packaging in general. Um, so again, activities, I don't want this to become a sort of Unilever show because lots of people are doing this stuff, but um, looking at refills where there's a sort of a keeper bottle, which you use time and time again, but then a small concentrated refill that you use to fill the product, huge plastic savings in that type of space, um, which we're looking to roll out across different innovations. So I think all these models are absolutely, as Peter said, the sort of reusing things before you recycle things where you can, um, absolutely. And then this hierarchy, the Lansing hierarchy, absolutely applies. Um, I suppose one of the key limitations from that is the infrastructure that is within different countries and within where you're deploying those reuse 
loops. Yeah, so again, you asked earlier on about the plastic piece. So, I mean, we have a target to sort of move towards 100% reused, recycled or composted. And, and I keep looking at that saying, well, which is it? And of course, <laughs> even from my lens, it's like, well, which is it? Is it reused, recycled or compost? And of course, the answer is, well, it's all of those, depending on where you are, um, is the answer. And so things that work in the UK geography might not necessarily work in South Asia or somewhere um, because of the because the infrastructure isn't there to deliver it. Um, Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so got a couple more questions. I can see there's a few come in and we haven't really touched so much in this panel session on LCA. It's come up a couple of times, but there is a specific question on LCA. Um, how for the LCA, how about the time scale involved in the whole process? And I guess um, I'm going to look to Peter um, to come in to hear, I guess it Ian's just made a comment about, you know, prescriptively defining the LCA boundaries. Um, so I guess, what's your perspective on that? So I, I read the question and took two perspectives on that. The, the timescale for LCA to do an LCA or the timescale for the sequestration and the recycling. So in, in terms of, if it's the simple one, how long does it take to do an LCA? A good one, minimum six months, uh, and you have to have lots of good, reliable, robust data. In terms of mitigation potential, for example, um, often for CO2 utilization, it, it's quoted as 100 years sequestration. Now, if you're in a circular economy, that really doesn't apply because the, the true circularity means that timescale is independent because you're in a cycle. So you can't put a timescale on a cycle. Um, so, but that relies on a robust life cycle uh, system. So, I would say don't don't get hung up on the time of the of the uh, life cycle, but the longevity of the life cycle. How many times for a catalyst? You talk about life. Uh, uh, you talk about uh, turnover numbers and turnover frequencies. In in terms of uh, LCA, the turnover frequency is how quickly can you recycle something. The turnover number is how many times can you recycle it. Uh, but again, like I say, circularity is limitless in time. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, so there's a couple more questions about consumers um, here to pick up. So um, one interesting one, which um, I'm gonna to look to Bing, I think, to help answer is, um, so we talk a lot about incentives and rewards, um, but how about punishment mechanisms? And I suppose this is kind of related to a carbon tax or sort of a something specifically like that. Is it worth researching these kind of um, punishment policies or models within the within this within this model, this circular economy? Yeah, indeed. I think uh, one thing that uh, we need to look at um, is to have an in-depth review on what are uh, the uh, carrot and what are the sticks available. And then uh, what we can do next is um, to um, looking at um, the um, relative and attractiveness on, on those and policies. So I, I, we, we could do a sort of a simulation on to looking at impact by implementing those potential uh, policies in place. Right. Thank you. And um, there's also a couple of questions here about government policy and how and the impacts that it has. So there's one here on waste um, with the question. So chemical recycling isn't defined in the UK law and it doesn't feature in DEFRA's def waste hierarchy. Given the government's green reputation is centred on the environment bill, would the panel expect to see more ambition and even a mention of chemical recycling in the text? So how could we, I guess, influence uh, DEFRA's waste hierarchy policy and would you expect to see chemical recycling come into play there? I don't know if anyone's got a specific opinion on this and would like to raise it, Louise? <laughs> Not really. Uh, <laughs> the. Uh, I guess the difficulty with, so on one hand, yes, of course it should be there. The difficulty is with up and coming innovations and new technologies mm -hmm. is that it can really skew what happens next if, if, if one is picked up, as, if you get very specific on this um, rather than, than the general idea. So I would, I would say yes, that you know, it would be weird if chemical recycling wasn't, didn't start featuring 
But at the same time, I, I would suggest at this stage, we are in this transition process where there are lots of different competing um, variations on things. The, you don't want to be too specific and box out something that could have um, legs later or more impact. But I'll leave it to the chemist to decide which one that is. Uh, Dave, you, you've got up. Yeah, I, I was just uh, certainly backing everything Louise has said, but I think we need to make sure that it doesn't rule out the circular economy, as sometimes has happened in the past with, with end of waste criteria. So I think it's very much, you know, taking it forward and, and making sure, and we touched on it earlier, about the punishment approach. We've got to be careful with taking a punitive approach because we're a global, you know, market and a lot of our members' biggest competitors are their own sites in different countries. So we've, we've got to make sure that any punitive actions are appropriate and really act to encourage the circular economy. Yeah, it's a really good point, Dave, thank you. Um, so I'm really conscious of the time, we've got a few minutes left and um, something I'd just like to touch upon before we, we do um, say goodbye is we've talked a lot about the circular economy and moving towards that. Now, equality, diversity, diversity and inclusion is becoming more and more important across society and is becoming a bigger issue um, across different um, levels and institutions across society. How can we, as a community, ensure that these values are embedded in a chemical circular economy, you know, ensuring a fair and just transition as we move, move forward? I think I personally think it's a really important topic and one that we should consider in everything that we do. So I'd just like to hear some of the panel's views on this. Um, Ian, I'd like to bring you in first, if that's all right. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the point I made on affordability. So I think the link between affordability and, and social injustice is obvious if I can't. And so um, it's absolutely absolutely cannot be that sustainable products are only affordable by the wealthy that's it doesn't work for the planet it, it, it's just completely wrong so i think i only have a very simple answer to that one which is that the solutions have to be affordable and therefore available to everybody um both within the uk but also globally why shouldn't an, a consumer in india who's hand washing their clothes have a sustainable product why should it only be a UK consumer with a top loading washing machine or a front loading washing machine or even having somebody else to wash their clothes if they're in India so th that's my only kind of comment on that is it, it to me it comes back to this affordability piece is a, is a key driver there. Brilliant thank you. Uh, Louise? Just going to build slightly on that and that, that we've talked about the opportunities for businesses of of circular economy and, and the chemical circular economy in particular and if you you know in order to create business models that can scale and deliver on that opportunity, you need the diversity because you need the um, diversity in um, in the audience and your consumers. So, so hopefully that con the consumer piece is so important, and and consumers are diverse. Even in the UK, you know, we, we can sit in a bubble uh, somewhere and actually not uh, create things that will drive behaviours in in other parts of the UK, let alone in India. Yes. It's, it's hugely important. Brilliant, thank you. So I think we have time for one more comment. Um, Bing, would you like to? Yes, yeah, sure. So I think, and obviously the EDI is embedded and, uh, throughout our center, through our research, that's so how we're aiming to provide recommendations on how the proposed circular economy uh, can achieve the sustainable development goals, uh, objective um, by addressing inequality, exclusion, and, and more importantly, empowering local businesses, SMEs. And uh, for example, that uh, know that 97% of business uh, in chemical sectors and are SMEs. And we need to work closely with them to understand and their concerns, barriers, and opportunities to adopt the circular business models. And, and, and also, we, we've also um, touched base around the wider community as well. Um, in, to the, in order to have the widespread adaptation of circular principles, it requires a focus on embedded um, circular skills and um, extensive technical skills uh, as well. And so I, I guess the universities and, and local authorities have an important role to play here in providing the necessary training skills and innovation needed to, to uh, by the uh, employers in the UK. And uh, we as a society, we need to uh, contribute and towards to addressing inequalities by addressing uh, some of the barriers faced by certain groups and um, age, disability, ethnicity, uh, ethnicity and gender by offering their fair 
and access to skills and training job force. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So um, I'd like to just thank the panel for this session today. It's been really interesting. Some really great views, I think, have been shared. And um, thank you to the audience for your excellent questions. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And I'd like to now hang, ha hand back over to Jin, um, who's going to close today's session. Thank you. Thank you much, Gina, and also thank you for all the panel members. I really enjoyed this, uh, this panel discussion. Uh, so I think this is towards the end of this uh, national launch event. So we started from talking about uh, the role of science and innovation as addressed by Richard's keynote. And then in the panel discussion, we extend this into, for example, the whole system approach. And we talk about various non-technical barriers uh, such as finance, uh, business model, uh, policy, and the publics, and we also touch the EDI aspect. So that's exactly our center is going to going to address in the next four years. Uh, so I would like to stop here and to to thank you all for for the speakers, for the panel chair and the panel members in bringing these uh, uh, interesting topics. And I will also would like to thank all the attendees. Thank you, thank you very much for your time this morning. I hopefully. Uh, you, you enjoyed uh, the section as much as I did. And I, I would also like to, to use this opportunity to thank the organizers, the technical support, and the CE Hub in bringing all these uh, interesting events together into this week. So after our center, there's, uh, there's a few more sections. If you're interested in other resources below, I would really recommend you to join other sections and also the national launch of the CE Hub in. Um, on, this, uh, on this Thursday. So again, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, if, please do keep it, sorry, so just, just last word. So please keep, keep in touch. And if you have any queries of you, you want to express your interest in, in receiving our updates, please send an email through to our email address that, that's appear in the chat box. Thank you very much. <laughs>